Romans. We've been, we've been studying our way through this epic book. This, and Romans is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. It's written to the church in Rome. It is a systematic explanation of, uh, you know, huge theological truths in the New Testament. And uh, what, we, what Paul's really been talking about is the gospel, what we call the good news. And so here's a verse we read before. It says, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. What Paul's talking about is that God's done something. There's a big announcement in the New Testament, and it's that God's done something to remedy the problem between man and God. And, and that thing he's done through the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's good news because it announces that God has removed barriers between us and God. As he says right there, it's the good news that anyone can be made right with God. And it's also an invitation to receive that. And he says that this happens, for, it is accomplished from start to finish by faith. It's not a religious checklist. It's not a workbook. It's not a merit badge system. It is something that he has done that we can entrust ourselves to. I want your payment for my sin to pay my way. I want your amnesty to apply to me. I want to be adopted into your family, God. And this is the offer of the good news. And it's an amazing thing. But Paul's also been telling us the bad news, and that's what we studied last week, right? That last week, Paul told us the story of human sin, the story of the problem between man and God and God's response. And what I want to do this week is actually return to a small part of that passage and just kind of zero in. We're going to take a little excursion here into just these verses right here, 18 through 20, where Paul makes a really fascinating point that, that deserves some extra attention. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. That's the bad news from last week. He says, Of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. He's, he's talking about in this passage that there, is, there are things to be known about God which anyone can know. Things that, that God has made evident to all people about himself. And this is called general revelation. All right. There's specialized revelation, like a prophecy or like a scripture. We're reading specialized revelation. But there's also revelation that everyone has, no matter where and when you live, no matter you know, if you've ever read the Bible or heard the name of Jesus or not. There are things that you can know about God just from the human experience itself, and that's called general revelation. That's what he's talking about here. And, he, and the point is, he's taking away the argument that anyone could say, well, I'm not responsible to, to acknowledge a God because how did I know? No one ever told me about God. He's saying, you know enough just by being a human being to have a response to God. And the problem, of course, is that as human beings, we like to suppress information that we get about God. This is his main point here. In this story of human sin, one of the things we do is we, we see and learn things about God and we kind of instinctively shove them down. We kind of instinctively plug our ears and don't hear. That's what this word means. It means to hold back or bind up or restrain or hinder. We kind of like to hinder truth that we hear about God. You ever play that game where you try to hold a soccer ball or a volleyball underwater? You ever play that? I was watching my kids play this recently. It's a suppression game. You're taking something that, that floats, and you're like, I'm going to make it not float. And how long can I make it not float? And then they let go, and it <laughs> launches out of the water. And I was watching them, and I was like, I can do that better, you know? Like, I'm way stronger than them. So, of course, I get in there, and I'm going to prove something, you know? 
And I'm like, watch this. And I push that thing down as hard as I can. And I didn't get a very good grip on it. <laughs> and it shot straight up and drilled me in the face. And I think that the truth is like that, you know? <laughs> if something's true, you can say what you want. You can think what you want. You can exert effort to say, no, it doesn't float. But the thing is, it does. And if it floats, and sooner or later, it's going to come up. And sometimes it's going to hit you in the face. Truth is like that. So why do we, why do we suppress truth? You know you do this sometimes, right? Aren't there things that you kind of want to turn a blind eye to? Why do we do that? I think as human beings, we do it because we're not dummies. You know, because we can figure out where certain truths lead. And we're like, ah, no, 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 I think I'm not going to see that part. When Tommy was little, I remember there was a night that I was putting him, well, I was getting ready to put him to bed. And I noticed that he was tired. And I said, hey, buddy, you're looking pretty tired. And he was like, No. And I was like, yeah, aren't you tired? No. Well, you've yawned five times in the last minute. No, I haven't. I'm like, you're not thinking about yawning right now? He's like... So I caught him. I pretended to look away. And I look back, and he's like... And I was like, you, you just yawned. And you know what he said? He said, that was a wake-up yawn. It's because I'm waking up. <laughs> now, why did he say that? Hmm, I want, it's because he's not a dummy. He knows if he admits, yeah, I'm tired, that he means he's going to bed. So let's just suppress the facts. It was funny, when I took him to bed later, he kind of threw a fit. And I said, now you're throwing a fit. That shows how tired you are. And you know what he said? I swear to God. He said, it's a wake-up fit. <laughs> actually said that. We suppress the truth when we sense that we will not like an implied consequence. You know, I don't like where it's going, so nah, I think I won't see that. And of course, when it comes to matters of God, when it comes to spiritual things, our pride instinctively resists the possibility of God. Because if I say, hey, there might be a God, well, right away you start to extrapolate. Well, wait a minute. If there's a God, then that means that I'm not the most important thing. That means I don't get to sit on the throne. That means that there might be things he thinks I should do that I don't really want to do, and I don't really want to do those. Uh, he might, he, I might have to submit to something else. Uh, I might be in the wrong. I might be answerable. If there's a God, then he, then he may have a problem with me. And so we're like, nah, I don't think so. It's an instinct because it's scary, honestly. I think that's understandable. If there's a God, well, that's a little scary. But there's a problem with suppressing the truth. And I think you know, I bet life has taught you this lesson, hasn't it? When we cram down on the truth, when we, when we see a door in our mind that we think we should open and we're like, nope, because I don't like where it might lead, what happens when we do that? Uh, I think that what happens is we start to build up dissonance, right? Because we know there's something that I'm, there's a rock I'm not willing to look under, and, and that builds a cognitive tension and dissonance. When I was an undergrad, I took a history seminar class, and I went in, and the professor was like, this is a semester-long class, four months, and we're going to write one paper. The whole class is writing one big paper, and you have four months, and here's a binder with all the information. And so, you know, being an arrogant fool, I thought, like, great, see you in three and a half months, you know? I'm a pretty good writer. I bet I'll be fine. And so I tossed that book to the side, and I went along with my life. And every so often, you know, two months later, I was like, maybe I should start. Nah, I'm busy. And I would just keep going, and I would see emails come across, people emailing about it. And I was like, oh, overachievers. Uh, and, and sometimes I would look at that binder and be like, maybe I should open that. No. But what happened is I started to feel a bad feeling. What was that feeling? It was like a low-grade anxiety. Because I don't even know. I don't know for sure what I'm supposed to be doing. And one night, it woke me up in the middle of the night. And I was like, what is bothering me? Oh, my God, it's that paper. Where is that binder? You know, it was under my bed. <sighs> I, you know, I blew it off. <laughs> 
And of course, to my terror, I discovered that it was like there was a whole program. I was supposed to schedule an appointment with the professor. I was supposed to turn in a bibliography two months ago. I was supposed to turn in an outline one month ago. And so I had to call this guy hat in hand and say, I haven't done any of it. And he was like, I just thought you dropped the class. <laughs> it, was, it was a horrible experience. Now, he was incredibly, I kind of can't believe it to this day, he was incredibly gracious and worked with me to get back on track, which I didn't deserve. But I learned a lesson, which is that when you have that voice that's like, hey, hey, you're ignoring something because you don't want to look at it, don't ignore that voice. When we do that on the big questions in life, like why am I here, what's the meaning of life, is there a God, when we do that on those topics, then the consequence is we never get satisfactory answers to the big questions. We don't answer them. We just say, well, what do I want it to be? I'm going to go with that. I'm going to just pretend it's what I want it to be today. But lurking in the back of our mind is the fact that we really don't know the answer to the big questions. That's why in the next verse, Paul says, for even though they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their reasonings and their senseless hearts were darkened. He said their thinking got cloudy. Their thinking went bad. And that's what happens when we suppress truth is we, we get into a fantasy world. We live in a world of just uh, confirmation bias where uh, I look for evidence to confirm what I want to be true. And it leads us down rabbit holes. It leads us to extremes. It leads us to, to follow things that aren't worthy of being followed. He says, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That, that, they, that they went for the creature. They worshiped, they ignored God and worshiped what he made. Isn't that a profound way to say it? To worship the creature rather than the creator. It's like you're, 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 you're texting with your girlfriend and she's texting you all these wonderful things and you say, I think I love her. I'm going to marry my phone because the texts are on this phone. That would be an example of worshiping the creature rather than the one who created them. He says this is how we live our lives and the problem with it is, is that it's a dishonest way to live ultimately. It's ultimately we end up buying into a series of lies because why? Because we, we suppress the truth. How about instead, and this is my main point really, how about an honest quest for truth? You know, what I should have done was open that binder and find out. It would have been bad news, I would have been disappointed, but it would have been better than what I did. And uh, I propose that this is the best way to live your life, an honest quest for truth. On the big questions, to say, I'm going to approach those with curiosity. I'm going to approach those big questions with integrity. What is, what is really true? What is actually true? That should be the question that guides me. Is there a God? Well, it doesn't matter if I want there to be a God or not. It really doesn't matter. What matters is, is there one? And, and that's called letting the truth be your guide. Where does the truth lead me? Or another way to say it is that we ought to follow the truth wherever it leads you. Whether it leads you somewhere you want to go or whether it leads you somewhere you didn't want to go, ultimately it's better to be aligned with the truth than not. And that's challenging. It's a scary prospect. This is, by the way, the standard that the Bible says to evaluate it by. The Bible's not afraid of being evaluated by the standard. The Bible says you shouldn't believe this because it's super persuasive or something. You should believe it because it's true. And if it's not true, if any word of this is not true, you shouldn't believe it, not even for a second. Only things that are actually true are worthy, to, are worthy places for your faith. And so the Bible says, here it is, go ahead, hold me up to the light, evaluate me, and decide for yourself if you think it's true. And if you think it's true, then you should follow it. And if you think it's not true, then you should not. 
What's cool is how the gospel opens the door for this kind of honest inquiry without fear because the message of the gospel is an amnesty. Yes, it's scary. The possibility that God might exist is scary. But listen to what this God is saying. He's saying, I've done everything to remove all the obstacles. I've I've paid for the problems between us myself. I've come in love, in sacrificial love, because I want to win you back because we belong together, and that's true. And so, uh, yeah, the Bible's a great thing because it disarms us and says, why don't you take a look at truth? Well, it says here that God, that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. He made it evident. And so maybe you're sitting here and you're like, well, how is that? What has God made evident to me? I haven't heard a vision from God or something. And so I want to spend the rest of our time thinking about this question, what information about God is available to all people? What, What is there that all of us can know? about God. And he actually tells us right here, he says, for since the creation of the world, three things, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen. His invisible attributes. It means that it's not written on a tree out there, you know, God is omnipotent, God is all-knowing. It's not, you know, it's not written somewhere, and yet it is written in that when you look outside, you can see that these things are true. They're invisible attributes of God. We can see that God is eternally powerful, that he's not just like pretty powerful. He's not just more powerful than me. His power is incalculable. It's unlimited. And, I, and I'll argue that the more you look at creation, the more this becomes undeniable. And that he has a divine nature, that God, that there is, there is a nature to him. He's not just a force. There's something personal. There's something brilliant. There's something creative. There's something relational about this God. And that that is evident just by looking around. Clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. He says, look around at what has been made and you will see these three things, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So, you know, this is the time of year where nature gets beautiful again, in my opinion. When you go outside and you walk around, here's a good challenge for this week. Take 20 minutes and find somewhere to go walk around in nature. Paul's argument is, when you do that, that it's going to make an argument to you about the existence of God. That, that when you go out there and walk around, you know, just observe. Observe what you see and ask, what do those observations tell me? Does it seem like this is a random accident that happened by chance, or does it seem like this was made? Does it seem like it's just chaos out of control, or does it seem like there's order and design? Does it seem like it's meaningless or does it seem like it matters and maybe has meaning? Does it seem like I'm just matter? Do you feel like matter? Do you feel like all you are is molecules and chemicals just sort of happening in a predictable way? Or are you also something more than matter? These are the questions that we have to grapple with. And I look at it and I say, man, it's beautiful. It is a beautiful day. Okay, well, is it beautiful? Is it that it seems beautiful to me because I'm an organism made of matter and I'm programmed to respond to a favorable way in a certain environment? Or is it also actually just beautiful? This is Paul's argument about nature. It's called evidence from creation. Go out and look at the night sky. You know, in the ancient world, they were fascinated by the night sky. They, they understood that there was a sort of rhythm and order to it, and they didn't understand it very well, not as well as we do, but they understood that there was, a, there was something to it, and, they, and that blew their mind. Here's Cicero, who's a Roman orator. He says, when we something, see something moved by machinery, like an orrery or a clock or many other such things, we do not doubt that these contrivances are the work of reason. He says, look at a clock. Did it ever cross your mind that that accidentally happened? No, you're like, of course, this was a work of reason. Someone reasoned out how to make this clock. 
And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, what is an orrery? <laughs> I had to look it up. An orrery is, there's a Lego orrery. It's one of those models, it's one of those models that shows how the solar system works, okay? And they didn't have ones as sophisticated as this, but they had more primitive orreries back then. And he says, look at this. Clearly, it's a work of reason. This is his argument. So, so play the thought game. Look at that Lego orrery. And now let me ask you a question. Where did it come from? Where did it come from? Is there any chance that it just happened by accident? If you had a big enough pile of Lego, a pile of Lego the size of this room, and you spent a million years swishing it around, would you ever get that? The gears are timed. The sun spins 25, time, 25 times, uh, goes all the way around every 25 cranks. The moon goes around the earth uh, every 28 cranks, and the earth goes around the sun in this model every 365 cranks. It is a work of reason. And, and Cicero's point is that when you look at the stars and you say, okay, if an orrery is a work of reason, then how much more the actual universe than this simplistic model of a tiny slice of it? You get his argument? He says, when therefore we behold the whole compass of the heaven moving with revolutions of marvelous velocity and perfect regularity, how can we doubt that all this is affected not merely by reason, but by a reason that is transcendent and divine? You see not the deity, yet by the contemplation of his works you are led to acknowledge a God. He says, I can't see God. And yet, I'm led to acknowledge him, right? I see something that is a work of reason. Paul would call it invisible attributes. And you know, you say, well, Cicero lived, Cicero lived a long time ago. You know, this is an old argument. I think this argument is stronger than ever. We know so much more about the night sky than Cicero could have ever dreamed. And the more we learn, the more profound this effect becomes. It isn't like, oh, you know, well, the mystery's gone. We get it now. No, we do not get it at all, this point that he's making. In fact, the evidence just keeps piling up for how incredibly complex the universe is. This is a Hubble image of the Pegasus dwarf galaxy. Cicero would have dreamed for a picture like this. Okay? Every point of light is a star. They estimate in Pegasus galaxy there's 100 million stars. Try to, try to get your head around the vastness of that. 100 million stars, each one with, a, with probably planets and moons. But it's a dwarf galaxy. Milky Way, they estimate, has around 100 billion stars. And there's big space between them. The distance between us and the nearest galaxy is incomprehensible. If you tried to drive in a car at 60 miles an hour from here to the nearest galaxy, it would take longer than it's taken that galaxy to form and it wouldn't exist by the time you got there. That's the closest galaxy. And now you ready for, the, the, you ready for your mind to pop? Do you know how many galaxies there are in the observable universe? An estimated 100 billion galaxies. Psalm 19.1, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard. It is a general revelation that all can see. Well, whether we're talking about the greatest expanse out or whether we're talking about the tiniest minutia, the littlest things, you know, let's go the other way. Take, get out the microscope and go down as far as you can see. What do we find? We find complexity. We find order. We find beauty. And we always find it. As far out as we can see and as small down as we can see, we always find the same thing. Anthony Flew is a British philosopher who spent 50 years arguing against theism. 
uh, pretty aggressively, made it his career. And then he shocked the world in 2007 when he published this book, There Is a God, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. He says, I now believe that the universe was brought into existence by an infinite intelligence. I believe that this universe's intricate laws manifest what scientists have called the mind of God. I believe that life and reproduction originate in a divine source. Why do I believe this? Given that I expounded and defended atheism for more than half a century? The short answer is this. This is the world picture as I see it that has emerged from modern science. He's saying the more we learn, the the more I cannot hold my ground. I cannot argue because the evidence becomes overwhelming. For him, it was DNA. It was looking at understanding DNA. He says, what I think the DNA material has done is that it is shown by the almost unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life that intelligence must have been involved in getting these extraordinarily diverse elements to work together. It's like the more I understand DNA, it's just impossible to imagine that these pieces could have come together in this way. Because the thing about DNA is it's not just material, it includes information. It is encoded information that works. So So the illustration is if you're walking along the beach and you see an Atari 2600, wash up. You know, you're like, wow, look at that. You know, how did this plastic form, you know, what happened in the churnings of the depths of the ocean to create this? It's a miracle. That would be a miracle if the ocean spit out an Atari 2600. But he's saying, he's saying, okay, I I argued that case. But then, but then when you look at DNA, it's like pulling out the cartridge and being like, but this says Frogger on it. And when you, and when you open it up, look at this, there is encoded data and it works. That, that, no, that could not be an accident. He says, I have been denounced by my fellow unbelievers for stupidity, betrayal, senility, and everything you could think of, and none of them have ever read a word that I have ever written. You can hear, you can hear the salt in his attitude there. What is that? That's, he's describing suppression. They don't even want to hear what I have to say. A thing to realize here, guys, is that if this is often portrayed as, is, you know, do you believe in God or do you believe in science? I think that's a false dichotomy, okay? Uh, science isn't a worldview. Science isn't a religion or an answer. Science is a method for discovering truth, a, a good method, and therefore science is a great thing if you're into honest inquiry. If you're into honest discovery of what's true, science is a great thing. My point is that science often points toward God. And all the more, the more information we get. Let me give you another example of more scientific information pointing to God. When we look at the the beginning of the universe, I think this is a good place to look because he actually says in our passage, since the creation of the world, that these things have been known about God. One of the things about the beginning of the universe is that scientists have noticed as they figured out how the universe works that there are these constants forces, things that are just true in physics, that are always true. But what's mysterious about them is that they seem very perfectly balanced, like, like very perfectly balanced. Like if they were any different, life couldn't exist. And yet there are things that are just in nature. So here's uh, Stephen Hawking. He says, the laws of science as we know them at present contain many fundamental numbers, like the size of the electric charge of the electron and the ratio of the masses of the proton and the electron. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. Most sets of values would give rise to universes that, although they might be very beautiful, would contain no one able to wonder at their beauty. Here's a list of the 34 constants. Honestly, you know, I was a history teacher, you guys. I don't know what most of these are. I've heard of the nuclear strong force. But I'm told that if the nuclear weak force, for example, was different in one part in 10 to the fourth, there would be no supernova, and that's what creates heavy elements. 
So that had to be exactly right for life to exist. Or how about the ratio num of number of protons to electrons? If it was different by one part in 10 to the 36th, no galaxies, no stars, no planets would form. Just extremely diffuse gas. In other words, we hit the cosmic lottery in, in, in order for life to exist. Here's what's crazy is the odds of any one of these are pretty astronomical, like I just said, okay? But you have to have all of them. You have to have all of them. And that number, the odds against the chance formation of all of those things hitting just that way are one in, what is that, 10 billion to the 124th. That's, if you're like, I can't get my head around that number. Exactly. You can't. Here's some quick comparison. Odds of being dealt a royal flush in poker on the first five cards, one in 649,000. Odds of being called, come on down on the price is right. <laughs> one in 36, pretty good. They call a lot of people out of that crowd. Odds of hitting Powerball, jackpot, one in 300 million. Odds of being injured by a toilet, <laughs> one in 10,000. That's kind of an alarming statistic, actually. <laughs> I expected that to be way more astronomical. <laughs> Odds of a meteor landing on your house, one in 182 quadrillion, right? Trillion. A lot. But the odds against the chance formation of the universe are 1 in 10 billion to the 124th. That is this number right here. It is an incomprehensible number. Those are zeros. Can you see that? Another example, the Big Bang. You've heard of the Big Bang, the origin of the universe. This was first postulated by Hubble in the 20s. He observed redshift, which indicated that the universe was expanding. And that suggests that it, came, it, it had a beginning and is expanding out. And when this happened, right away he was decried. There are these fantastic quotes of people calling this a crackpot theory of saying this is just going to be fodder for the creationists. Actually, the guy who coined the term Big Bang was using it pejoratively. He also called it a crackpot theory. And yet, this has been proven over and over and over again. And if you, if you read cosmologists, I watch a debate between cosmologists, and one of the first things they said was, everyone accepts the Big Bang. If you can't accept the Big Bang, you don't have a place on this stage. Those were their words. Everyone accepts this is true. But it creates a couple big problems for naturalists, that's someone who would say, there's no God, nature and matter can explain everything. Well, there's two big problems with the Big Bang. One of them is that it appears to describe a beginning, that there was a beginning. And not just the beginning of planets and stuff, not, not just the beginning of like the stuff in the universe, the beginning of the universe itself. This is the theory, that it's the beginning of space, that it's the beginning of time, that it's, the, that it's the beginning of all matter. That's the theory. And so that creates a problem. Where did that come from? Did something come from nothing? The argument goes, whatever begins to exist has a cause. The Big Bang Theory says that the universe began to exist, therefore it suggests the universe had a cause because things don't happen without a cause. The other problem is the extreme precision of the Big Bang scenario. It itself is an incredibly complex and perfect. It, is, it had to be exactly perfect in a number of ways. Here's Paul Davies, physicist. He says, if the initial explosion... Like, so how strong was that explosion? He says that strength of the explosion had to be exactly what it is. It had to be exactly what it is and not more and not less, or we'd get a totally different result. He says, if the initial explosion of the Big Bang had differed in strength by as little as one part in 10 to the 60th, the universe would have either quickly collapsed back on itself or it would have expanded too rapidly for stars to form. In either case, life would be impossible. And then he interacts with that number, 10 to the 60th. He said, an accuracy of one part in 10 to the 60th can be compared to firing a bullet at a one-inch target 
on the other side of the observable universe, 20 billion light years away, and hitting the target. And you're like, well, I bet bullets go straight in space. I could hit that. Yeah, but you can't aim. In this scenario, you can't aim because that would be design. You have to randomly hit it. This is probably my favorite example. Sean Carroll, who is a genius, theoretical physicist at Caltech. I was listening to the TED Radio Hour a couple years ago on NPR, and he was being interviewed about this exact question, the Big Bang. Here's what he says. He says, the universe at early times near the Big Bang was very, very smooth. At early times, those hundred billion galaxies were squeezed close together. And you have to imagine doing all that squeezing without any imperfections, without any little spots where there were a few more atoms than somewhere else, because if there had been, they would have collapsed under the gravitational pull into a huge black hole. He's saying all the atoms in the universe had to be basically perfectly arranged, perfectly balanced to get the Big Bang that we had. Keeping the universe very, very smooth at early times is not easy. It's a delicate arrangement. It's a clue that the early universe is not chosen randomly. There is something that made it that way, and we would like to know what. Now, when I heard that, I sat up, you know, like, okay, yeah, that's what I think. Something had to make it that way, and he's agreeing with that. So, of course, the interviewer asks, right? He says, at the beginning, if there was order, could it suggest that there was something that intended it to be that way? Carol says, it could be. If you ask a question like that, the answer is, yeah, it could be. There's many things that are possible. That's certainly something that people have thought about. There's something called the teleological argument or the argument from design for the existence of a supernatural creator that says that, you know, features of our universe, if they were very different, wouldn't have allowed for us as human beings to exist. But the early universe, interestingly, the problem is not just that it was quite orderly, but that it was really way more orderly than it needed to be for us to be here. So listen to his argument. He says, if you really want to make the argument that the universe is set up to allow for the existence of life or humanity or something like that, the early universe is overkill. So it seems that whatever the explanation is for why the early universe has the features it does, that's not really a good one. We need something to explain why it is so exquisitely low entropy. That's order. So many particles in such a very, very specific state. He's saying it's too orderly to be just for human life. You have to explain why it's so perfect, is what he says. And I'm like, yeah, that doesn't hurt my argument at all. <laughs> he says, and as physicists, we have theories, you know, we don't know which one is right. And it's early times as far as this big question kind of thinking goes. But it's not hard to imagine that we'll get a good physics explanation rather than reaching for something beyond the physical world. Well, the interviewer presses him. Well, like, what do you think? What's your, what's your theory? Because there are a few theories. There's string theory. There's, uh, you know, um, that there were uh, fields that could have uh, spontaneously created something. Uh, that, that there's, there's an arrow of time argument. Here's what he says. He says, maybe the Big Bang is not the beginning of the universe. An egg, an unbroken egg, is a low entropy, high order configuration. And yet, we don't open our refrigerator and say, oh, how surprising to find this low entropy configuration in our refrigerator. That's because an egg is not a closed system. It comes out of a chicken. Maybe the universe comes out of a universal chicken. <laughs> now... I don't want to make fun of him because he's a million times smarter than I am. And he's making a joke. He's saying it in a funny way, okay? But uh, that's the leading theory. That's the multiverse theory. That what made this perfect universe that perfectly sustained life? Well, one answer is that somewhere beyond, there's something generating infinite amounts of universes. Millions, billions, trillions of universes ready to big bang. And then if you did that a gazillion times, one of them would hit in such a way that could sustain life. That's the argument. There isn't any evidence for this. It's just a theory that answers the question. This, th this is unobservable. We could never see this if it existed. But I see a problem with it is that I would, you know, seems like the universe chicken would be a pretty high order, low entropy configuration too. Where did that come from? What is he saying? He's saying, I know there is something behind the universe. 
I know it's there and that it is astonishingly complex and incomprehensible in its perfection. I know that I don't know anything about it. But one thing's for sure, it's not God. (laughs) And I'm confident that physics will someday be able to explain it. That is faith. Everybody has faith in something. That's faith in physics. That's faith in matter. It's a lot of faith, too. You know, what takes more faith? To believe in God, who is declared with evidence, or in a universe chicken, with the attributes of God, for which there is no evidence. You know, I'm sitting here listening, I'm like, you're describing God. It's perfect, it's creative, it creates things that are high order. I'm like, just cut to the chase and call it God. The big problem here is that matter ultimately cannot account for matter. If, if, if you've exchanged God for matter, and you say, matter's my God, physics and matter can explain everything. Okay, well, where did matter come from? Uh, you run into a problem right there. Matter can't explain. Why does anything exist at all? If you accept the Big Bang, like nearly all scientists do, then that means either something caused it, or something came from nothing. Those are the two. And actually, it's a little bit worse than that. It's either that something caused it or everything. Everything came from nothing. And if you can believe that everything came from nothing, then you have greater faith than I do. The fact is, the more we learn, the more the world around us points to a creator, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature. There's one other thing he says here, too. He says, that which is evident... Uh, which is known about God, is evident within them. So he says, look at the creation of the world. Look at the world around you. But he also invites them to look within. And that's a whole other branch of inquiry. You know, ask yourself, okay, do I feel like I'm just matter? Or does it feel like there's more to me than that? What is it about you if I say you're nothing but matter? You're just chemicals. You're a predictable chemical reaction. What doesn't sit right with you about that? This is called internal evidence, that, that you yourself are evidence for God. For example, that we believe that in a thing called personhood, that I'm not just the collection of atoms that you call Ben Faust. There's a person, Ben Faust. That's not possible if there's no, that's not real. That's an illusion if there's no God. Or how about the idea that we're making a choice A lot of people don't realize that philosophically there can be no such thing as choice if there's no supernatural dimension to things. Do you realize that? Stephen Hawking realizes it. He says the molecular basis of biology shows that the biological processes are governed by the laws of physics and chemistry and therefore are as determined as the orbits of the planets. So it seems that we are no more than biological machines and that free will is just an illusion. I know it seems like you chose to put on the pair of shoes, but you didn't. You are a super complicated orrery and that you made the decision that was, that was determined by your biological machinery and physics. That decision that you stayed up late laboring over, you did not choose. Or morality. Is there a right and wrong? Here's something that we can all agree on. There are things that are right and things that are wrong. But do you realize that if there's no God, there's really no basis for saying that? On what basis is anything wrong? This is a big philosophical problem for naturalists. You say, murder is wrong. Why? If we're just matter. Why is it any more wrong than tearing up a dandelion? Well, because uh, societies create morals, they say, to help the benefit of the species. Your, 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 your culture kind of works out a moral system because it's advantageous for you as human beings. Okay, so does that mean that if it was advantageous to the species to murder, that it would be good? That's what Hitler thought. No, or is it that there is, is it that murder is wrong because life has a value that is not based in matter, right? Is it, is it, that, is it that humans matter and that murder is always wrong no matter how you feel about it? Yeah. Paul says that this is evidence of God's law being written on our heart and in our conscience. 
What about human value and equality? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that there, is, that there is something inherently valuable about people that makes us equal. If you take God out of the equation, this doesn't make sense anymore. It's one of the great ironies of our society. We want to say very strongly, everyone matters. But we're standing on a Judeo-Christian foundation when we say that. If you also say, and there's no God, well, why does everyone matter then? On what basis? You say, you know, is, you know people aren't equal. Stephen Hawking is not equal to me intellectually. He's way greater than me intellectually. So what? Am I less valuable? Are you less valuable? You say, well, I just know that people have equality because it feels right. Okay, then my counter-argument is, why does that feel right to you? Is it because you know intuitively it's true? It suggests we have value which suggests a creator. That we have purpose and significance, that life isn't meaningless. That you do matter, and what you do matters. And we crave that because we are created for it. How do you account for these things outside of a creator? You can't. You cannot very well account for any of these things. If you want to deny a creator, the only option is to either embrace the super uncomfortable implications of people being stuff, people being matter, or to live inconsistent which are, with our beliefs, which is what many people do, is to say, well, philosophically, I don't believe in choice. And then you'll see these, these physicists will be asked, well, do you live that way? Oh, no, of course, no one can live that way. Can you live as though your children are just inanimate matter? No. So we can embrace the implications of it, we can live inconsistently, or we can just never think about it, which is what probably most of us do, which I would argue is called suppression. When we live a certain way, it betrays what we think is actually true, no matter what we say. And the fact is, you and I, we live like we are more than matter, don't we? We do. Well, the Christian worldview doesn't have a problem accounting for any of these things. We don't have a problem accounting for it. Why do I have value? Because I'm created by someone who values me. You know, do I make choice? Yes, because I'm made by a choosing being. How can a personal being arise from an impersonal world? Oh, you didn't. You came from a personal being. Well, what caused the Big Bang? The uncaused cause. God himself, I am, who was and who is and who is to come, who made me, who loves me, who formed me in his image. We possess these qualities because our maker possesses these qualities. You can learn a lot about God just by looking at yourself. When I was a little kid, sometimes I'd come down in the morning for school and there'd be a paper bag sitting on the table with my name on it. You look in there, peanut butter and honey sandwich, baby carrots, Cheez-Its, fun size pack of M&M's. Where did it come from? I didn't make it. There's nobody around. Where did it come from? And yet you can know a lot about who made it just by looking at it. Okay? The person who made this could reach the shelves where the Ziploc bags are held. The person who made this understands basic nutrition and the food groups. The person who made this had foresight to put something in a Ziploc bag to preserve it. The person who made this can speak language and know letters. The person who made this is kind-hearted because they gave me M&Ms, you know? The person who made this knows me. They know my name. I'm building it up, but like it's a mystery. It's not a mystery, you know? Who made it? It wasn't me. God knows it wasn't my sister. My mom made my lunch just like she always did. I didn't see her make it. But I know that she made it, and I can know a lot about her just by looking at it, and so are we the same way. You look at yourself and say, Who, what accounts for you? What accounts for you? Does an immaterial, impersonal universe account for you? I ask you. I suggest it doesn't. I suggest that you have a spiritual parent too. A heavenly father who made you and has called out across time to bring you back into his orbit where you belong. 
So today, or this week sometime, go for a walk and observe. And I challenge you to ask this question, what if there is a God? What if there is a God out there? And my point is that I don't think that the answer to that would be as terrible as you think. It might not be as scary as you think. If there's a God out there, then that means there might be actual answers to the big questions that lurk in the back of your mind. It means that you don't have to worry about your value or your place. It means that there might actually be such a thing as right and wrong. It means that, that, that this God may have indeed put out an amnesty for you to come to him, that he may want you to bring his life under his orbit, and that, and that real change is possible, and that real hope is possible. So come and meet this God who made us all.